My name is Don Vino. I'm, uh, in addition to being president of EMNR, I'm president of Midwest Christian Outreach, Inc. Uh, main office in Wonder Lake, Illinois. Our senior researcher is Ron Hensel, who was on the panel up there today. Uh, and um, we're gonna open, oh, the title of this is The Legacy of Leaning into Heresy. So you know you're in the right place. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time to uh, just be together. We thank you for this conference, this seminary location, and uh, the hearts that you have brought here who have a passion for defense of the faith and reason, reaching those in uh, non-Christian religions and cults. We just uh, give this uh, time in your hands as we talk about issues within the church. Pray us in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. A couple in their 90s are both having some problems remembering things. During a checkup with a doctor, he tells them they're physically okay, but they might want to start writing things down a little to help them remember. I can identify with that. Later that night, while watching TV, the old man gets up from his chair and says, want anything while I'm in the kitchen? His wife says, well, would you give me a bowl of ice cream? Sure. Don't you think you should write that down, she asks. No, I can remember that. Bowl of ice cream, no problem. Well, I'd like some strawberries on top also. Maybe you could write that down so you won't forget it. I got it. Bowl of ice cream, strawberries on top, no problem. I'd also like some whipped cream. Now that I think about it, I'm certain you'll forget that, so why don't you write it down? And he gets a little irritated. He goes, I don't need to write it down. I can remember. Ice cream, strawberries on top, whipped cream. I got it, no problem, for goodness sakes. He wanders off to the kitchen, and about 20 minutes later, he returns. He has in his hands a plate of bacon and eggs. She stares at him for a little while, and then says, where's the toast? <laughs> Most don't realize how subtly doctrinal shift occurs. It's kind of like the brain. It goes a little at a time. It sneaks up on you. What you start out doing ends up being not what you finish with. Most people don't wake up in the morning and jump out of bed and go, I think I'm going to reject the doctrine of the Trinity, for example. It is a little at a time, usually. The essentials of the faith is just a slight lean from one to the other. My friend Dr. Norman Geiser points out that uh, when you're flying an airplane, a prop plane, single engine prop plane, you are continually steering to the right because the propeller, all by its natural self, steers you to the left. It takes you away from center. Doctrine happens the same way. If we don't stay diligent on it, uh, it we shift a little bit at a time gradually, usually by redefinition. So we're going to kind of look at what we might call the ABCs uh, of leaning into heresy or heresy prevention. Uh, Julie Roys writes in the, uh, the uh, was a host of the WMBI radio show uh, uh, called uh, Up for Debate. And in January 25, 2018, she posted a provocative headline in her blog, which asked the question, do all uh, MBI professors affirm inerrancy? It depends on your definition, she writes. Two Moody professors last year admitted in a Bible Theology Division meeting that while they affirmed a Moody's doctrinal statement, they rejected the Chicago statement as well as uh, what's known as the correspondence view of truth. This is really critical. So you have professors at an august institution, Moody Bible Institute, right? It's been around forever. It is viewed as a solidly orthodox institution. No fear to send little Johnny or Janie off there for a Bible education. The problem is the professors, some of the professors, say they affirm the doctrinal statement of Moody, but there's a definitional problem. Uh, one of the things that she brought out is uh, uh, Moody's leadership. She had been trying to bring that into correction with the leadership. Uh, she was stonewalled. Uh, the 
they ended up after this public revelation of tightening up their doctrinal statement a little bit in the area of inerrancy and the Trinity as well. How did it happen to begin with? Well, it was a gentle lean. It was a slight change in definition, and so no one really noticed. The professors were all using the same language, but they applied different meanings. If you have caught anything in some of the discussions on cults, what you'd notice is they use the same language, but they have different definitions to the terminology. That's a really, really important uh, thing to understand. In Genesis 3.1, we see this uh, in action. The serpent was more crafty than the other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? What is he doing? He's subtly posing a question. He is, as Ron Hensel mentioned in the roundtable discussion, causing doubt to rise. Do I really know what God has said on this issue? The woman said to the serpent, We may freely eat of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you do what? Touch it. Touch it. Did God say that? So the doubt is cast. There's a gentle lean away from the truth and an addition of something into the discussion that God didn't say. So the ABCs would be this. I'll be aware. Definitions can be slippery. Pastors and professors can be sloppy. Good-hearted people can make mistakes. Be biblically centered. Sola Scriptura is a standard for determining truth. Not even a church council is the sole determiner of truth. It is the Word of God. Sola Scriptura. Contextually conscious. This one I can't emphasize enough. I cannot, I, I have a, a young man, Andre Traversa, my friend James sitting over here knows him. Andre was in a cult called Urantia. He calls me anywhere from one to three times a day. Andre's blind. He reads the Bible more than any five people I know. Yes. It took him a while to understand this uh, concept of context, historical grammatical context. And as he started grabbing a hold of it, he would call me and ask me questions like, how do we know the resurrection is physical? It's a great question. Because we have pastors that are literally teaching that God has a body prepared for us in heaven, waiting for us to pass away and then we will get our new body. But that's not biblical. So we have to walk through what the context is. What did the apostles mean when they wrote certain passages? And how do we follow the language that's being used? It's usually fairly simple. Diligently discipling. This one is an important one that is often missed, even in apologetics. Diligently discipling. We disciple unbelievers into the faith, and we disciple believers once they are in the faith. And apologetics is a tool in both cases. It's not the only tool. There's other aspects of the Christian life, obviously. But it is a tool that prevents us from slipping into heresy, from leaning into something that is false. Most of the New Testament was written in response to false beliefs, false teachers. The mandate to the Ephesian elders was to be on guard, ever vigilant over the flock. Paul meets them and says, be careful, now pay careful attention to whom? to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure fierce wolves will come in among you not sparing the flock and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away disciples after them. That's Acts 20, 28 through 30. It's something that we tend to miss. Who are the pastors supposed to pay attention to? I tell, what, does it, what does the text say? Pay attention to yourselves. Pay attention to yourselves. That's the first order of business, and we tend to become sloppy about that. We don't always quiz ourselves to make sure that what we're teaching is biblically accurate. We sort of get involved in the task of preparing a sermon. 
uh, and we read a lot of material, listen to a lot of teachers, much, frankly, of what we believe. I would suggest we get by osmosis almost. It's in the air we breathe because of the people we hang around with. Um, I want to mention a name that uh, many of you may not even be uh, familiar with, Rosie Greer. Roosevelt Greer was a football player. Mm -hmm. right. I saw him, large man, big guy, on something called the Mike Douglas Show. This dates me. And he was, uh, he was crocheting on the Mike mm -hmm. Douglas Show. And Mike Douglas said, uh, does anyone make fun of you for that? And he looked at him and said, would you? <laughs> and he made a really interesting statement this big football player he said you will be the same person in five years that you are today except for two things the people you meet and the books you read your views change based on who you hang around with and what you read and what you fill your mind with uh, and that comes by those relationships and by that material so Paul says to be careful Pay careful attention to yourselves. Secondly, to all of the flock. Why? The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Your job is to do boundary maintenance. Make sure that the flock you're leading is safe and cared for. Why? Because false teachers are going to try to creep in. We Culture is always trying to invade the church to change what we believe. And within the church... Individuals will rise up teaching odd things. Okay? Fairly simple. Something we miss. The Galatians is a great example of a group leaning into heresy. Slightly leaning into heresy. They took them into overblown heresy. Paul writes to them in 1.6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you to the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. What was the issue and how did this happen? What was occurring in the Galatian church? Well, it was a slight heresy, just a slight lean, just a little bit of a change that made major differences. To the point that Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? In other words, you've been deceived, right? It, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ is publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? How did the Judaizers manage the shift? How did they do that? What was the issue? Was it salvation or was it something else? Think about this a second. Was it the, the salvation that was at issue, or was it something else that they used to twist a little bit? It was sanctification. Uh -huh. It wasn't salvation. It was saint. How do we know that? The text. He asked this question. Are you so foolish, having be what? Begun. Begun by the Spirit. Salvation is not in question. Will you now be perfected in the flesh. It's your sanctification that's in question. So these Judaizers came in and they said, okay, you're saved by grace. We don't have a problem with that. But if you're truly saved, you need to be sanctified. And how are you sanctified? By your own works. Mm -hmm. So now what do you have to do? You have to be circumcised. You have to be keeping the law. You have to do all of these things. Why? Because that's how your sanctification comes about. It's an effort that you do by yourself rather than something that God is doing to you and for you. A slight lean into heresy made a full-blown difference in how they lived out the faith, and they became legalists as a result. Mm -hmm. We have examples of this. Um, a name that you won't know, probably you may remember, which is Bill Gothard. Mm -hmm. Is the name? Okay. Bill Gothard is a Judaizer. Mm -hmm. He says things like, first hour of the first night of the seminar he give, gave, umbrella is like, uh, 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 obedience is like an umbrella of protection. If you stay under the umbrella, obviously you're protected. 
If you get out from under the umbrella of protection, you are in rebellion, and rebellion is a, the sin of witchcraft. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something about that that sort of sounds right, that we need to be under authority. And, and he defined authority as this top-down structure. And then in the first hour, he tells us that Jesus, the only story we have of Jesus' childhood is at, his, uh, uh, at the age of 12 when he stayed behind and his parents came back frantically searching through the town looking for Jesus and he had to make the tough decision to get back under the umbrella of protection of his parents now think about that a second what does that imply he got out from under the umbrella protection to begin with because if he had to make a decision to get back under that means he got out from under it so we asked Bill, does that mean Jesus is a sinner? The re sin of rebellion, right? Yeah. Rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. False teaching. He leaned into it a little, and unfortunately he influenced about three million people into that view to varying degrees. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, how many believe they are desperately heretical in this room? Okay, good. Uh, their current views are the result of some gentle leaning, subtle shifts over time, just a little bit at a time. Uh, Charles Taze Russell, for example, wrote, uh, We believe in the hell of the Bible. That sounds pretty positive, doesn't it? This the uh, uh, Sheol, the only word used for hell for 4,000 years is translated more than one half of the time grave in our common version and should always be thus translated, Hades, in the New Testament. Is its equivalent to Gehenna fire of the New Testament is a symbolical picture declared to signify the second death. So we believe in hell, but guess what they just did? redefined what hell means so it sounds like they're affirming the truth of scripture but then they take it away simply by definition so again as we look at the idea of being aware uh, most words in most languages have a range of meaning So we have to figure out by the context what the meaning of the word in any sentence or paragraph is used. Be biblically centered. Russell didn't like the idea of punishment and eternal hell. So he simply uh, redefined it to make it fit something he liked. Now, that starts making some differences then in how you look at other doctrines. Contextually conscious. What would the hearers or readers have understood of what was spoken or written at the time it was spoken or written and be diligently discipling. Russell didn't have anyone discipling him and so in his life he had to explain and teach issues as they arose and so his doctrine really developed and we see that in Joseph Smith, uh, Mary Baker, Eddie and a number of others, cult leaders. Uh, we don't learn everything all at once and often we wander off into the woods and need to be brought back. The denial of hell and eternal torment created a whole other series of problems. We don't really realize that. Why does the Watchtower teach the kinds of things they teach on the nature of humans? Well, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, there is no soul. Why is there no soul? Because if there is no hell, what do you do with the soul of somebody after they die? Resurrection, then, has to be redefined as a recreation. Why? Because the person who died goes to the dust of the ground, they cease to exist. Why? Because there's no hell. So now we have to recreate a being to replace the one that died. That's what they call resurrection. But then what do you do with the person who had died? Now you have a physical body. Well, for the Watchtower Bible Tract Society, they have God making a recording, a duplicate recording, of your original, what they call life pattern, your memories and experiences, that after he creates this new body, he makes a copy of his copy to put into this new person. It's very complicated, and it evolved over a number of years. Most Jehovah's Witnesses don't realize that, by the way. 
And so, uh, sometimes when we talk to them, we have to kind of walk them through that whole process uh, so that they come to realize that they don't, they are not resurrected. A, a newly created being replaces them. We went through this with an elder at one time. This is interesting. And he affirmed each step of the way as we read watched our material. Yes, that's true. Uh, we have a, we don't have a soul. We are a soul. Uh, we have a life pattern, which is our memories and all of that. We have a life force, which is electricity. It doesn't take on our personality characteristics. Uh, then God unplugs us. We cease to exist. And then God creates a new being that looks like us and downloads a copy of our memories and life pattern into this newly created body. And we said, okay, so if God could do that after you've died, could he do it now? So there's no actual connection between the you sitting here and the you he's going to recreate. And he said, well, he wouldn't do that. And we said, well, maybe he wouldn't, but that's not the question. Could he do that is the question. And he said, maybe. I mean, could he create one of you right now, march right in here, we could shoot you between the eyes, and guess what's really cool? You would be able to go home and, and sleep with your wife and play with your kids in, as a newly created person because he was very upset that we said that. We said, well, this is not our teaching. This is your teaching, right? Russell leaned into this because he didn't like the idea of hell. Uh, the scriptures weren't the basis for his beliefs and practices. God didn't take a vote, but simply instructed us about two possible destinies in his, in his view. He wasn't contextually conscious and he wasn't being discipled. The denial of hell and eternal, eternal torment created a whole system of problems uh, as we went through that. No, uh, if there's no hell, what do you do with the physical part of non-physical part of man? If there's no resurrection, you have to recreate something. If there's no person, then you have to have a copy of the person. So according to the Watchtower, they write that Jesus is dead, forever dead. He wasn't re resurrected he was simply recreated mm -hmm. well how do evangelicals fare on the question of the resurrection uh, a number of years ago bill hybels at willow creek community church started off a talk that said what happens five minutes after you die and he said five minutes after you die you're immediately resurrected what are the implications of that takes five minutes to be resurrected <laughs> What happened for four minutes? Pardon? <laughs> I said, what happened for four minutes? Yeah. Well, <laughs> what happened to the body? Yeah. Where is the body in all of this? Is the body in the grave? Or was the body resurrected? For him, the body was not connected at all to the resurrection. Uh, and so I wrote to him. I tried to be as kind as I could to affirm the ministry of Willow Creek to the best of my ability. And pointed out that the resurrection is physical that Paul talks about the seed. There's a seed somewhere in this physical body. There's a physical connection between this body I'm in and the resurrection that will come from this body to which my soul will be rejoined. That is the biblical teaching. It is physical. Uh, it took him three months of sorting this out with a friend of mine who worked there, Mark Middleberg, another apologist. Uh, and he went to Mark and Mark called me and said, I am so glad. Uh, that you brought that up because I was leaving for Australia that day. I heard him say that and I knew there would be blowback and I'm glad that you're the one that caught it. Uh, and uh, I have affirmed to him that you are correct, that he is heretical in this point. He finally wrote a letter back and said, you know, we have rethought it. I realized that it was wrong. I will make sure not to do this again. And the next week he did it again. <laughs> yeah. Or how about this one? Another seminary. Dr. Murray J. Harris, some may be familiar with that name. He was one of the translators of the uh, NIV Bible. Uh, good scholar, nice man, taught at Trinity Seminary. He argued in a book called From Grave to Glory that Jesus uh, was raised bodily, but not physically. It's a definitional problem, see? The shift is subtle, just a slight lean, but it makes a, a huge difference in how we understand the teaching of the resurrection. And the reason he gives 
for this position is that Jesus was not continuously visible to the eyes of the disciples. He was therefore resurrected immaterial and non-fleshly, but was capable of temporary materializations. This is precisely Watchtower teaching, by the way. So is the resurrection physical or non-physical? It's physical. Is our resurrection body separate from this body? Is it in heaven waiting for us? No. It is comes out of this body, is the teaching in 1 Corinthians 15. The chapter on the resurrection is very clear about that. So we need to be aware. Pastors, professors, and others can be mistaken. Uh, for the pastors that may be listening or even in this room, my wife has a statement that sometimes we point out. Uh, <laughs> well, now, now it's going to escape my brain. I hate it when that happens. Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, pastors, professors, and others can be mistaken. Be, be biblically centered. The scriptures are the source of authority on these issues. When we're dealing with this thing with the Murray Harris, I was at a very large conference uh, uh, manning a booth to answer this question, and easily half of the pastors that came by asked me this question, how do you know the resurrection was physical? Now, I can't help it. I am snarky by nature. And I said, have you, like, read the Bible? <laughs> they were offended. Mm -hmm. I was okay with that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Diligently discipling. Get a hold of what we see today and pass it on to those you are teaching. Make sure that they are clear on their doctrine because it affects every single other thing that they will... Uh, form their views on about the Christian life. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. This is core stuff that he's going to give us now. It's essential doctrine in the form of an early church creed. I don't know if you realize this. This creed was in existence by 38 AD. The battle for the resurrection began very early on. It was codified in the form of a creed that was passed on to Paul. He tells us that he got it, and we know about when he got it. And he writes this, I delivered to you as of first importance. How important is this? Number one, this is the thing you've got to understand. What I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8. Someone might rightly point out that he doesn't define the nature of the resurrection here. And that's true. He does, though, in verses 12 through 34, argue that the resurrection, uh, uh, that there is a resurrection. And in 35, he turns his attention to this, this very question. Verse 8, uh, this is kind of funny. Because I've had some people say, well, he doesn't really tell us what the nature of the resurrection is. And he goes, well, that's true. But some may ask, Paul writes, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? That's the question we're asking, right? You foolish person! <laughs> I think Paul's snarky, too. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies, and what you sow is not the body that is to be but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of grain, uh, some other grain, but God gives it a body as he has chosen to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there are, is one kind for birds, another for animals, another uh, for humans, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory, 1540 through 41. The heavenly bodies and earthly bodies in verse 40 are defined in verse 41. 
what is the one thing which all of these bodies, he's named, he's named all these different kind of bodies, what is the one thing all of them have in common? They're physical. Every one of them is physical. None of them is some immaterial spiritual substance. It is physical. So we have to pay attention to the words being used by the speaker or writer and how a little word makes a big difference. In this case, there's a little word that he goes through as he describes the resurrection. It's a two-letter word that occurs several times. What, what word? It. it. What is the word referencing? The body. the body. He's always pointing back to the body. He doesn't deviate. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It. What is it? The body. Is sown in dishonor. It. What is it? Body. Is raised in glory. It. Body. Is sown in weakness. It. The body. Is raised in power. It. The body. Is sown a natural body, it, it is, body. is raised a spiritual body, not spirit body, spiritual. There's a difference between spiritual and spirit. We have spiritual people here in this room. It doesn't mean we become invisible and incorporeal. It has to do with how it is powered, empowered. Thus it is written, the last man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural, then the spiritual, verses 42 through 46. Uh, I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Here's a question. What is he talking about? Does he mean physical bodies can't be in heaven? Ah, if we just follow through the context, he's going to tell us what he means. Right, right? Yeah. but if you just isolate that, yeah. it looks like it's... Well, right, and that's why you'll have groups that will, even within the, the church, that will yeah. say, well, you can't have physical bodies in heaven, because right here it says, clearly it says, flesh right. and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. How is this phrase used in Scripture, though? Right. Again, uh, we'll go to a different passage here. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but our Father who is in heaven. Now, is he saying a physical body hasn't revealed it to you? Or is he saying something else? Yeah, he's saying a natural person, an unregenerate natural person, didn't reveal this to you. But God revealed it to you. Ephesians 6.12 For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. He's not talking about wrestling against meat on bone or physical bodies. He's saying we're not wrestling just with unregenerate people. We're, 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 we're wrestling with cosmic powers, spiritual warfare is going on around us. Doesn't the scripture... Uh, Tell us the disciples on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him? Doesn't it say that? Doesn't that mean he didn't have the same body? No, it doesn't. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But what happened? So is the problem with the body of Jesus? No. 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 It's with the eyes of the disciples. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And what happened? They recognized him. Eyes were opened. Eyes were opened and they recognized him. So notice, this is really important because as we follow the flow of the context, it tells us what the answer is. It wasn't some immaterial body that he manifested as Murray Harris said, temporarily, but nonetheless really for evidential reasons for the eyes of the disciples. Rather, it was the problem was with the eyes of the disciples, not with the body of Jesus. Paul says to pay careful attention to yourselves and all of the flock. I would suggest Moody Bible Institute got into trouble with their professors because they didn't ask fundamental questions. Correspondence truth means 
as something measurable, testable, what we believe corresponds to reality. Instead, they had a more or less postmodern view of truth, which means I can give it any definition I want to. Uh, Al Muller, president of uh, Southern Evangelical Seminary, not Southern Evangelical, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, when he took over, he had a number of postmodern professors there. And he told them they were fired. And they were not happy, and so they said, you can't do that. And he said, why not? And he said, well, we have a contract. He said, okay, well, let me see the contract. And so he read the contract. And he said, okay, now you have a postmodern view of truth, not a correspondence view of truth. Uh, postmodern view of truth means that the, the reader determines the meaning of the text. The writer isn't here. And so as I read the contract, it tells me you're fired. <laughs> and they said, we will sue you. And he said, that's because you don't really believe what you say you believe. You can't get away from that. We lean into heresy gradually. We don't always see it happening. It's sort of an imperceptible thing. Like the guy who goes off to the kitchen to get ice cream with strawberries and whipped cream and comes back with bacon and eggs and no toast. He got confused a little bit along the way and came back with something completely different than he started with. We see this happening in churches a lot. The resurrection is just but one thing. Sanctification, like the Galatians, is another thing. Is sanctification by our works, or is it by what the Spirit of God does to us and for us? Uh, name any doctrine you want to, the doctrine of the Trinity. How many Christians don't understand the doctrine of the Trinity? How many Christians redefine Jesus because they don't really like the Jesus they find in the Scripture? And they want a kinder, gentler uh, Jesus who's non-judgmental. So, uh, we're going we're gonna to start wrapping up here. We've got about three or four minutes if anyone has any questions before I run. Yeah, one, as, um, as a pastor, uh, pastoring churches uh, particularly, do you have like any recommendation like when the pastor sits down trying to look at what he wants to do preaching schedule wise, how, how often you should try to revisit doctrinal subjects and stuff. That is a really cycling. good that is a really good question. How often to reveal doctrinal subjects? Well, um, I don't know what your style is. I really like this is my personal preference and my pastor I'm spoiled frankly does this this way. Mm -hmm. We preach through the book of the Bible verse at a time and pretty much every doctrinal thing you're going to come up with is going to come up as you go through scripture. And so it makes it regular on, on a regular basis. So number one. Number two, we have something we call at our church the Wonder Lake Bible Institute. And it's a four-year program. Every single Sunday morning, you're going to go through something. Uh, Old Testament overview. Um, Essential Doctrines of the Faith will be the next section. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, let's say. We deal with doctrines there. So it is for us kind of central in everything we do at some point because it's going to come up. I mean, you can't go through the Gospel of John, for example, without hitting the fundamental doctrines. You just can't, <laughs> right? Unless you're a thematic preacher. Now, there is where you're going to get into trouble. Uh, yeah, it is. And, and I don't know what your church structure is. I, I know um, we had our summit meeting, and, and, and oftentimes when I speak in churches, I'll start off with a statement like this. Uh, I didn't, when I came here, I didn't promise to not offend somebody, and I'm probably pretty sure I will offend somebody before I'm done. So just be prepared to be offended. I'm not a fan of seeker sensitive churches. And I'm not a fan of seeker sensitive churches because they lose the very thing you asked about. Mm -hmm. And the desire to, quote, be relevant, you have to sacrifice something. Now, I, I'm going to, you don't, you don't have a Bible here, so. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. In, uh, in 1 Corinthians, you know where I'm going already, 14. We have this interesting thing, and I would suggest that we have, many churches have misplaced the ministry of the church and replaced it with the mission of the church. Hmm. Here's why I say that. As Paul is writing 1 Corinthians 14, he makes something that many, that I, I, I don't know very many people have caught this. 
Which Paul makes an assumption, 1423, he makes an assumption as he writes the text. What does 1423 say? 1423 says, So, if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who are uninstructed or some unbelievers come in, will that they not say that you are out of your mind or crazy? Okay. So, if some unbelievers come in, what does that assume? If Assuming you're not always going to be there. They're not normally going to be there. They might come in. They might wander in. And obviously they should be welcome. But the church is instruction for them because they are not normally there. What's the next passage say? It says, 24 says, But if an unbeliever or an instructed person comes in while everyone is prophesying, he will be convinced or convicted and called to account by all. And the secrets of his heart will be revealed. So he will fall face down and worship God, proclaiming, God is truly okay, right. among you. So, again, if an unbeliever comes in, two times, in two verses, in the same book, one right after another, Paul assumes unbelievers aren't there. Which means this, our teaching in church should be for believers. That's the ministry of the church. The ministry of the church is equipping, training, ministering to uh, caring for, praying with, it's the family life of the believer to prepare them for service within the body and for ministry, for mission outside the church. Mission is evangelism. That happens out there. So the idea that we have to sneak up on, on unbelievers to get them in the church so we can trap them into the gospel, it's just not really, it's foreign to scripture. So what does that do with your question? How often? regularly all the time whenever you're preaching you're looking through and say okay how does this affect the deity of christ how does this affect the doctrine of trinity how does this affect the physicality of the resurrection how does this affect the inspiration of scripture there's only five or six things and if they're kind of forefront in what you're doing on a regular basis mm -hmm. then you sort of start getting into a groove of checking out the text why here's a great example john 1 1 through 3 do you realize that John is pointing you back to Genesis 1? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't get that. Why is he doing that? Because he's telling you who created the heavens and the earth, right? Mm -hmm. So why is he telling you that? Because Jesus says, guess who? God, God right? So you see, right there in the first verse of John, he's teaching the doctrine of the Trinity. Why? Because the Proto-Gnostics were denying it. You have the same thing in 1 John. What is he talking about? He's talking that God took on human form. That which we saw, which we touched, which we rubbed shoulders with, which we, we smelled, we ate with, we heard. Yeah, we were there. So he was physical. Uh, all the way through. So your question really is, all the time, those essential doctrines are going to influence how you teach your people. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? I, yeah. I grew up in a church, um, going back to that, where that was an issue <laughs> constantly. You know, uh, they would jump around everywhere and just totally miss all the basics and fundamentals. So it was. It's not a real good practice, you know, because it's. You're, you're choosing what you want to do or what you want to touch on. And when you do that, it becomes you're the one controlling it instead of being controlled by what the Bible says, what the Holy Spirit says. You know, and then they would claim that God gave them the message that they felt led by the Spirit to say this. But again, it, it's, just, uh, it's just not cool. Yeah, I uh, interim pastor to church some years ago. This is kind of funny because when I when I first came, uh, when I first was asked to do that, I started. I would go through scripture one passage at a time, all the way through a book of a Bible. Uh, and uh, the elders at first became a little concerned because they thought they said we're saying, I don't know if our people are going to get this. This sounds hard. And I go, Well, thinking is hard, but that's okay. You'll get used to it. <laughs> you just practice it. Yeah. And, and after about six or eight weeks, the elders started doing some unusual things. They started buying books on theology and reading them. And they were learning stuff. Yeah. And they thought, and they said, I never knew this was in here. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then uh, 
Now, I'm kind of laid back. I mean, I, I sort of like the country life. And so we had this lady come in one time, and I was teaching through First Corinthians. And, and it came to, we were talking about the issue of baptism. And she's Catholic, and so she raises her hand. And, and she doesn't know you're not supposed to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, you know, can I help you? And she goes, do you mean I don't have to be baptized to be saved? And I go, well, that's, well, that's exactly what I mean. And we talked through that. And she, I mean, she accepted the Lord that day. Because all of a sudden salvation was clear to her. Now here's the interesting thing. I was teaching the body of Christ. I wasn't looking for seekers. But a seeker wandered in. Right? And she was convicted. Verse 24. The thoughts of her heart were revealed. And she became a believer. The elders afterwards were very concerned. Why did you let her talk in church? I said, because she had a question. And we're here to answer that question. And she became a believer. What could be better than that? Well, so they got kind of used to a different way of looking at the role of the pastor and the role of the church. So, um, I don't know. That's, that's, that's kind of where my heart is at and all that sort of stuff. But, uh, leaning into heresy. Heresy sneaks up on you. If you're not diligent, it will sneak up on you and strangle you. So, how do you look at uh, a lot of churches nowadays? I know the one I go to, you know, they try to have... Um, you know, invite people to church, or we're going to have a try to have a high attendance day. Invite oh, your friends to church. So, you yes. know, battling that, how would you, you know, look at inviting visitors versus, you know, because you don't you don't want to close off, I guess, the entire church and say no visitors allowed, because you say if visitors do come, and you do want to invite, I guess, people who are you were hoping mentoring or who are who are having yeah right I would. Thing, right. But you just don't want to just invite, you know, I guess the just the general public, public just to have numbers, I guess, right? right? Well, that's the, that's the point. Okay. You don't you don't do it just to have numbers. I am not. Um, this is my bias, and I, I have to tell you, some people just have a problem with my positions on this. I have looked through Scripture, trying to find something that says something like. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to accumulate as many nickels and noses in this building as you can. I just can't really find that. Mm -hmm. I've looked for it because I have friends. That's kind of their mission in life, and I just don't. And I offend them when I tell them I don't really find it. That doesn't mean don't invite anybody, yeah. Yeah. Right. right? It does mean it's what is your focus? Problem. What are you focused on? Uh I gotta tell you, I love the early church. It was full of heresy, unbelievably full of heresy. Almost every letter we have written was written because of heresy. So the church has never been perfect, it's never been pristine, and I don't want anyone to get the idea that I'm advocating some pristine, unadulterated church that's always had trouble. But they did something that was really unique and unusual. Their time together as a family was to minister to one another. An unbeliever would come in and they would join in sometimes in the meals and the different kinds of things that they were doing. Like I would invite friends I have or sometimes even strangers to my house at Thanksgiving and we've done that. My son might show up with somebody he just met who's a homeless person uh, and bring him in and they just partake with the family of our Thanksgiving dinner and that's perfectly fine and that's really what you're asking me. Can we invite people like that? Yes. Is the goal to minister to people or is the goal to increase numbers? If the goal is to increase numbers, don't bother. Good question. <laughs>